Part ten of a collection of stories, reviews, and essays by Willa Siebert Cather. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part ten The Bohemian Girl Sections one and two. The Transcontinental Express swung along the windings of the Sand River Valley, and in the rear seat of the observation car a young man sat greatly at his ease, not in the least discomfited by the fierce sunlight which beat in upon his brown face and neck and strong back. There was a look of relaxation and of great passivity about his broad shoulders, which seemed almost too heavy until he stood up and squared them. He wore a pale flannel shirt and a blue silk necktie with loose ends. His trousers were wide and belted at the waist, and his short sack coat hung open. His heavy shoes had seen good service. His reddish-brown hair, like his clothes, had a foreign cut. He had deep-set, dark-blue eyes under heavy reddish eyebrows. His face was kept clean only by close shaving, and even the sharpest razor left a glint of yellow in the smooth brown of his skin. His teeth and the palms of his hands were very white. His head, which looked hard and stubborn, lay indolently in the green cushion of the wicker chair, and as he looked out at the ripe summer country, a teasing, not unkindly smile played over his lips. Once, as he basked thus comfortably, a quick light flashed in his eyes, curiously dilating the pupils, and his mouth became a hard straight line, gradually relaxing into its former smile of rather kindly mockery. He told himself, apparently, that there was no point in getting excited, and he seemed a master hand at taking his ease when he could. Neither the sharp whistle of the locomotive nor the brakeman's call disturbed him. It was not until after the train had stopped that he rose, put on a Panama hat, took from the rack a small valise and a flute-case, and stepped deliberately to the station platform. The baggage was already unloaded, and the stranger presented a check for a battered sole-leather steamer trunk. "'Can you keep it here for a day or two? he asked the agent. "'I may send for it, and I may not.' "'Depends on whether you like the country, I suppose,' demanded the agent in a challenging tone. "'Just so.' The agent shrugged his shoulders, looked scornfully at the small trunk, which was marked N.E., and handed out a claim check without further comment. The stranger watched him as he caught one end of the trunk and dragged it into the express room. The agent's manner seemed to remind him of something amusing. "'Doesn't seem to be a very big place,' he remarked, looking about. "'It's big enough for us,' snapped the agent, as he banged the trunk into a corner. That remark, apparently, was what Nils Ericsson had wanted. He chuckled quietly as he took a leather strap from his pocket and swung his valise around his shoulder. Then he settled his Panama securely on his head, turned up his trousers, tucked the flute-case under his arm, and started off across the fields. He gave the town, as he would have said, a wide berth, and cut through a great fenced pasture, emerging when he rolled under the barbed wire at the farther corner upon a white dusty road, which ran straight up from the river valley to the high prairies, where the ripe wheat stood yellow and the tin roofs and weathercocks were twinkling in the fierce sunlight. By the time Niels had done three miles, the sun was sinking, and the farm wagons on their way home from town came rattling by, covering him with dust and making him sneeze. When one of the farmers pulled up and offered to give him a lift, he clambered in willingly. The driver was a thin, grizzled old man with a long, lean neck and a foolish sort of beard, like a goat's. "'How fur you goin?' he asked, as he chucked to his horses and started off. "'Do you go by the Ericsson place?' "'Which Ericsson?' the old man drew in his reins as if he expected to stop again. "'Preacher Ericsson's.' "'Oh, the old lady Ericsson's,' he turned and looked at Nils. "'La, me! If you're going out there, you might a rid out in the automobile. That's a pity now. The old lady Ericsson was in town with her auto. You might a heard it snorting anywhere about the post office or the butcher shop.' "'Has she a motor?' asked the stranger absently. 
"'Deed, and she has. She runs into town every night about this time for her mail and meat for supper. Some folks say she's afraid her auto won't get exercise enough, but I say that's jealousy. Aren't there any other motors about here? Oh, yes, we have fourteen in all, but nobody else gets round like the old lady Erickson. She's out, rain or shine, over the whole county, charging into town and out amongst her farms and up to her son's places. Sure you ain't going to the wrong place? He craned his neck and looked at Neil's flute-case with eager curiosity. The old woman ain't got any piani that I knows on. Olaf, he has a grand. His wife's musical. Took lessons in Chicago. I'm going up there to-morrow, said Nils imperturbably. He saw that the driver took him for a piano tuner. Oh, I see. The old man screwed up his eyes mysteriously. He was a little dashed by the stranger's non-communicativeness, but he soon broke out again. I'm one of Miss Erickson's tenants. Look after one of her places. I did own the place myself once it, but I lost it a while back in the bad years just after the World's Fair. Just as well, too, I say, let you out of paying taxes. The Ericksons do own most of the county now. I remember the old preacher's favorite text used to be, To them that hath shall be given. They've spread something wonderful, run over this here country like bindweed. But I ain't one that begrudges it to em. Folks is entitled to what they can get, and they're hustlers. Olaf, he's in the legislature now, and a likely man for Congress. Listen, if that ain't the old woman comin' now, want I should stop her? Niels shook his head. He heard the deep chug-chug of a motor vibrating steadily in the clear twilight behind them. The pale lights of the car swam over the hill, and the old man slapped his reins and turned clear out of the road, ducking his head at the first of three angry snorts from behind. The motor was running at a hot, even speed, and passed without turning an inch from its course. The driver was a stalwart woman, who sat at ease in the front seat and drove her car bareheaded. She left a cloud of dust and a trail of gasoline behind her. Her tenant threw back his head and sneezed. Woo! I sometimes say it as lief be before Mrs. Erickson as behind her. She does beat all nearly seventy, and never lets another soul touch that car. Puts it into commission herself every morning, and keeps it tuned up by the hitch-bar all day. I never stop work for a drink of water that I don't hear her a-churnin' up the road. I reckon her darter-in-laws never sets down easy nowadays. Never knows when she'll pop in. Miss Otto, she says to me, we're so afraid that that thing'll blow up and do ma some injury yet. She's so terrible venturesome." says I. I wouldn't stew, Miss Otto. The old lady'll drive that car to the funeral of every daughter-in-law she's got. That was after the old woman had jumped a terrible bad culvert. The stranger heard vaguely what the old man was saying. Just now he was experiencing something very much like homesickness, and he was wondering what had brought it about. The mention of a name or two, perhaps, the rattle of a wagon along a dusty road, the rank, resinous smell of sunflowers and ironweed, which the night damp brought up from the draws and low places. Perhaps, more than all, the dancing lights of the motor that had plunged by. He squared his shoulders with a comfortable sense of strength. The wagon, as it jolted westward, climbed a pretty steady upgrade. The country, receding from the rough river valley, swelled more and more gently, as if it had been smoothed out by the wind. On one of the last of the rugged ridges, at the end of a branch road, stood a grim square house with a tin roof and double porches. Behind the house stretched a row of broken, wind-racked poplars, and down the hill slope to the left straggled the sheds and stables. The old man stopped his horses where the Erickson's road branched across a dry sand creek that wound about the foot of the hill. "'That's the old lady's place. Want I should drive in?' No, thank you. I'll roll out here. Much obliged to you. Good night. His passenger stepped down over the front wheel, and the old man drove on reluctantly, looking back as if he would like to see how the stranger would be received. As Nils was crossing the dry creek, he heard the restive tramp of a horse coming toward him down the hill. 
Instantly he flashed out of the road and stood behind a thicket of wild plum bushes that grew in the sandy bed. Peering through the dusk, he saw a light horse, under tight rein, descending the hill at a sharp walk. The rider was a slender woman, barely visible against the dark hillside, wearing an old-fashioned derby hat and a long riding skirt. She sat lightly in the saddle with her chin high and seemed to be looking into the distance. As she passed the plum thicket, her horse snuffed the air and shied. She struck him, pulling him in sharply with an angry exclamation, Blasne! in Bohemian. Once in the main road, she let him out into a lope, and they soon emerged upon the crest of high land, where they moved along the skyline, silhouetted against the band of faint color that lingered in the west. This horse and rider, with their free rhythmical gallop, were the only moving things to be seen on the face of the flat country. They seemed, in the last sad light of evening, not to be there accidentally, but as an inevitable detail of the landscape. Nils watched them until they had shrunk to a mere moving speck against the sky, then he crossed the sand creek and climbed the hill. When he reached the gate, the front of the house was dark, but a light was shining from the side windows. The pigs were squealing in the hog corral, and Nils could see a tall boy who carried two big wooden buckets moving about among them. Halfway between the barn and the house, the windmill wheezed lazily. Following the path that ran around to the back porch, Nils stopped to look through the screen door into the lamp-lit kitchen. The kitchen was the largest room in the house. Nils remembered that his older brothers used to give dances there when he was a boy. Beside the stove stood a little girl with two light yellow braids and a broad flushed face, peering anxiously into a frying pan. In the dining-room beyond, a large, broad-shouldered woman was moving about the table. She walked with an active, springy step. Her face was heavy and florid, almost without wrinkles, and her hair was black at seventy. Nils felt proud of her as he watched her deliberate activity, never a momentary hesitation or a movement that did not tell. He waited until she came out into the kitchen, and, brushing the child aside, took her place at the stove. Then he tapped on the screen door and entered. "'It's nobody but Nils, mother. I expect you weren't looking for me.' Mrs. Erickson turned away from the stove and stood staring at him. "'Bring the lamp, Hilda, and let me look!' Nils laughed and unslung his valise. "'What's the matter, mother? Don't you know me?' Mrs. Erickson put down the lamp. "'You must be, Nils. You don't look very different, anyway. Nor you, mother. You hold your own. Don't you wear glasses yet?' "'Only to read by. Where's your trunk, Nils? Oh, I left that in town. I thought it might not be convenient for you to have company so near the threshing-time.' "'Don't be foolish, Nils,' Mrs. Erickson turned back to the stove. "'I don't thresh now.' I hitched the Wheatland on to the next farm and have a tenant. Hilda, take some hot water up to the company room and go call little Eric. The tow-haired child, who had been standing in mute amazement, took up the tea-kettle and withdrew, giving Nils a long, admiring look from the door of the kitchen stairs. "'Who's the youngster?' Nils asked, dropping down on the bench behind the kitchen stove. "'One of your cousin Henrik's.' How long has Cousin Henrik been dead? Uh, six years. There are two boys. One stays with Peter and one with Anders. Olaf is their guardian. There was a clatter of pails on the porch, and a tall, lanky boy peered wonderingly in through the screen door. He had a fair, gentle face and big gray eyes, and wisps of soft yellow hair hung down under his cap. Nils sprang up and pulled him into the kitchen, hugging him and slapping him on the shoulders. "'Well, if it isn't my kid! Look at the size of him! Don't you know me, Eric?' The boy reddened under his sunburn and freckles and hung his head. "'I guess it's Nils?' he said shyly. "'You're a great guesser,' laughed Nils, giving the lad's hand a swing. To himself he was thinking— that's why the little girl looked so friendly. He's taught her to like me. He was only six when I went away, and he's remembered for twelve years. 
Eric stood fumbling with his cap and smiling. "'You look just like I thought you would,' he ventured. "'Go wash your hands, Eric,' called Mrs. Erickson. "'I've got a cob corn for supper, Nils. You used to like it. I guess you don't get much of that in the old country. Here's Hilda. She'll take you up to your room. You'll want to get the dust off you before you eat.' Mrs. Erickson went into the dining-room to lay another plate, and the little girl came up and nodded to Nils, as if to let him know that his room was ready. He put out his hand, and she took it, with a startled glance up at his face. Little Eric dropped his towel, threw an arm around Nils and one about Hilda, gave them a clumsy squeeze, and then stumbled out to the porch. During supper Nils heard exactly how much land each of his eight grown brothers farmed, how their crops were coming on, and how much livestock they were feeding. His mother watched him narrowly as she talked. "'You've got better looking, Nils,' she remarked abruptly, whereupon he grinned, and the children giggled. Eric, although he was eighteen and as tall as Nils, was always accounted a child, being the last of so many sons. His face seemed childlike, too, Nils thought, and he had the open, wandering eyes of a little boy. All the others had been men at his age. After supper, Nils went out to the front porch and sat down on the step to smoke a pipe. Mrs. Erickson drew a rocking-chair up near him and began to knit busily. It was one of the few old-world customs she had kept up, for she could not bear to sit with idle hands. "'Where's little Eric, mother?' He's helping Hilda with the dishes. He does it of his own will. I don't like a boy to be too handy about the house. He seems like a nice kid. He's very obedient. Nil smiled a little in the dark. It was just as well to shift the line of conversation. What are you knitting there, mother? Baby stockings. The boys keep me busy. Mrs. Erickson chuckled and clicked her needles. How many grandchildren have you? Only thirty-one now. Olaf lost his three. They were sickly, like their mother. I supposed he had a second crop by this time? His second wife has no children. She's too proud. She tears about on horseback all the time. But she'll get caught up with yet. She sets herself very high, though nobody knows what for. They were low enough bohemians she came of. I never thought much of bohemians. Always drinking." Nils puffed away at his pipe in silence, and Mrs. Erickson knitted on. In a few moments she added grimly, "'She was down here to-night, just before you came. She'd like to quarrel with me and come between me and Olaf, but I don't give her the chance. I suppose you'll be bringing a wife home some day?' "'I don't know. I've never thought much about it.' "'Well, perhaps it's best as it is,' suggested Mrs. Erickson hopefully. "'You'd never be contented tied down to the land.' There was roven blood in your father's family, and it's come out in you. I expect your own way of life suits you best. Mrs. Erickson had dropped into a blandly agreeable tone, which Nils well remembered. It seemed to amuse him a good deal, and his white teeth flashed behind his pipe. His mother's strategies had always diverted him, even when he was a boy. They were so flimsy and patent, so illy proportioned to her vigour and force. They've been waiting to see which way I'd jump, he reflected. He felt that Mrs. Erickson was pondering his case deeply as she sat clicking her needles. I don't suppose you've ever got used to steady work, she went on presently. Men ain't apt to if they roam round too long. It's a pity you didn't come back the year after the World's Fair. Your father picked up a good bit of land cheap then, in the hard times, and I expect maybe he'd have give you a farm. It's too bad you put off coming back so long, for I always thought he meant to do something by you. Nils laughed and shook the ashes out of his pipe. I'd have missed a lot if I'd come back then, but I'm sorry I didn't get back to see father. Well, I suppose we have to miss things at one end or the other. Perhaps you are as well satisfied with your own doings now as you'd have been with a farm, said Mrs. Erickson reassuringly. Land's a good thing to have, Nils commented, as he lit another match and sheltered it with his hand. His mother looked sharply at his face until the match burned out. Only when you stay on it, she hastened to say. Eric came round the house by the path just then, and Nils rose with a yawn. 
"'Mother, if you don't mind, Eric and I will take a little tramp before bedtime. It will make me sleep.' "'Very well. Only don't stay long. I'll sit up and wait for you. I like to lock up myself.' Nils put his hand on Eric's shoulder, and the two tramped down the hill and across the sand creek into the dusty high road beyond. Neither spoke. They swung along at an even gait, Nils puffing at his pipe. There was no moon, and the white road and the wide fields lay faint in the starlight. Over everything was darkness and thick silence and the smell of dust and sunflowers. The brothers followed the road for a mile or more without finding a place to sit down. Finally Nils perched on a stile over the wire fence, and Eric sat on the lower step. "'I began to think you would never come back, Nils,' said the boy softly. "'Didn't I promise you I would?' "'Yes, but people don't bother about promises they make to babies. Did you really know you were going away for good when you went to Chicago with the cattle that time?' I thought it very likely, if I could make my way. I don't see how you did it, Nils. Not many fellows could. Eric rubbed his shoulder against his brother's knee. The hard thing was leaving home, you and father. It was easy enough, once I got beyond Chicago. Of course, I got awful homesick, used to cry myself to sleep, but I burned my bridges. You had always wanted to go, hadn't you? Always. Do you still sleep in our little room? Is that cottonwood still by the window?" Eric nodded eagerly and smiled up at his brother in the gray darkness. You remember how we always said the leaves were whispering when they rustled at night? Well, they always whispered to me about the sea. Sometimes they said names out of the geography books. In a high wind they had a desperate sound, like something trying to tear loose. "'How funny, Nils,' said Eric dreamily, resting his chin on his hand. "'That tree still talks like that, and most always it talks to me about you.' They sat a while longer, watching the stars. At last Eric whispered anxiously, "'Hadn't we better go back now? Mother will get tired waiting for us.' They rose and took a short cut home through the pasture. 2. The next morning Nils woke with the first flood of light that came with dawn. The white plastered walls of his room reflected the glare that shone through the thin window shades, and he found it impossible to sleep. He dressed hurriedly and slipped down the hall and up the back stairs to the half-story room which he used to share with his little brother. Eric, in a skimpy nightshirt, was sitting on the edge of the bed, rubbing his eyes, his pale yellow hair standing up in tufts all over his head. When he saw Nils, he murmured something confusedly, and hustled his long legs into his trousers. "'I didn't expect you'd be up so early, Nils,' he said, as his head emerged from his blue shirt. "'Oh, you thought I was a dude, did you?' Nils gave him a playful tap, which bent the tall boy up like a clasp knife. "'See here, I must teach you to box.' Nils thrust his hands into his pockets and walked about. "'You haven't changed things much up here.' Got most of my old traps, haven't you?" He took down a bent, withered piece of sapling that hung over the dresser. If this isn't the stick Lou Sandberg killed himself with! The boy looked up from his shoelacing. Yes, you never used to let me play with that. Just how did he do it, Nils? You were with father when he found Lou, weren't you? Yes. Father was going off to preach somewhere, and as we drove along, Lou's place looked sort of forlorn, and we thought we'd stop and cheer him up. When we found him, Father said he'd been dead a couple of days. He tied a piece of binding twine round his neck, made a noose in each end, fixed the nooses over the ends of a bent stick, and let the stick spring straight, strangled himself. What made him kill himself such a silly way? The simplicity of the boy's question set Nils laughing. He clapped little Eric on the shoulder. What made him such a silly as to kill himself at all, I should say? Oh, well, but his hogs had the cholera, and all up and died on him, didn't they? Sure they did, but he didn't have cholera, and there was plenty of hogs left in the world, weren't there? Well, but if they weren't his, how could they do him any good? Eric asked in astonishment. Oh, scat! He could have had lots of fun with other people's hogs. 
He was a chump, Lou Sandberg. To kill yourself for a pig, think of that now. Nils laughed all the way downstairs, and quite embarrassed little Eric, who fell to scrubbing his face and hands in the tin basin. While he was patting his wet hair at the kitchen looking-glass, a heavy tread sounded on the stairs. The boy dropped his comb. "'Gracious! There's mother! We must have talked too long!' He hurried out to the shed, slipped on his overalls, and disappeared with the milking-pails. Mrs. Erickson came in, wearing a clean white apron, her black hair shining from the application of a wet brush. "'Good morning, mother. Can't I make the fire for you?' "'No, thank you, Nils. It's no trouble to make a cob-fire, and I like to manage the kitchen stove myself.' Mrs. Erickson paused with a shovel full of ashes in her hand. "'I expect you will be wanting to see your brothers as soon as possible. I'll take you up to Anders' place this morning. He's threshing, and most of our boys are over there. Will Olaf be there?' Mrs. Erickson went on taking out the ashes, and spoke between shovels. "'No, Olaf's wheat is all in, put away in his new barn. He got six thousand bushel this year. He's going to town to-day to get men to finish roofing his barn. So, Olaf is building a new barn, Nils asked absently. Biggest one in the county, and almost done. You'll likely be here for the barn raisin. He's going to have a supper and a dance as soon as everybody's done threshing. Says it keeps the voters in a good humor. I tell him that's all nonsense, but Olaf has a long head for politics. Does Olaf farm all Cousin Henrik's land? Mrs. Erickson frowned as she blew into the faint smoke curling up about the cobs. Yes, he holds it in trust for the children, Hilda and her brothers. He keeps strict account of everything he raises on it, and puts the proceeds out at compound interest for them. Nils smiled as he watched the little flame shoot up. The door of the back stairs opened, and Hilda emerged, her arms behind her, buttoning up her long gingham apron as she came. He nodded to her gaily, and she twinkled at him out of her little blue eyes, set far apart over her wide cheekbones. "'There, Hilda, you grind the coffee, and just put in an extra handful. I expect your cousin Nils likes his strong,' said Mrs. Erickson, as she went out to the shed. Nils turned to look at the little girl, who gripped the coffee-grinder between her knees and ground so hard that her two braids bobbed, and her face flushed under its broad spattering of freckles. He noticed on her middle finger something that had not been there last night, and that had evidently been put on for company, a tiny gold ring with a clumsily set garnet stone. As her hand went round and round, he touched the ring with the tip of his finger, smiling. Hilda glanced toward the shed door through which Mrs. Erickson had disappeared. "'My cousin Clara gave me that,' she whispered bashfully. "'She's cousin Olaf's wife.'" Sections 3 and 4 Mrs. Olaf Erickson, Clara Vavikra, as many people still called her, was moving restlessly about her big bare house that morning. Her husband had left for the country town before his wife was out of bed. Her lateness in rising was one of the many things the Erickson family had against her. Clara seldom came downstairs before eight o'clock, and this morning she was even later, for she had dressed with unusual care. She put on, however, only a tight-fitting black dress which people thereabouts thought very plain. She was a tall, dark woman of thirty, with a rather sallow complexion, and a touch of dull salmon red in her cheeks, where the blood seemed to burn under her brown skin. Her hair, parted evenly above her low forehead, was so black that there were distinctly blue lights in it. Her black eyebrows were delicate half-moons, and her lashes were long and heavy. Her eyes slanted a little, as if she had a strain of tartar or gypsy blood, and were sometimes full of fiery determination, and sometimes dull and opaque. Her expression was never altogether amiable, was often indeed distinctly sullen, or, when she was animated, sarcastic. She was most attractive in profile, for then one saw to advantage her small, well-shaped head and delicate ears, and felt at once that here was a very positive, if not an altogether pleasing, personality. 
the entire management of mrs olaf's household devolved upon her aunt joanna vavrika a superstitious doting woman of fifty when clara was a little girl her mother died and joanna's life had been spent in ungrudging service to her niece clara like many self-willed and discontented persons was really very apt without knowing it to do as other people told her and to let her destiny be decided for her by intelligences much below her own it was her aunt joanna who had humoured and spoiled her in her girlhood who had got her off to chicago to study piano and who had finally persuaded her to marry olaf ericsson as the best match she would be likely to make in that part of the country joanna vavrika had been deeply scarred by smallpox in the old country she was short and fat homely and jolly and sentimental she was so broad and took such short steps when she walked that her brother joe vavrika always called her his duck she adored her niece because of her talent because of her good looks and masterful ways but most of all because of her selfishness clara's marriage with olaf ericsson was joanna's particular triumph she was inordinately proud of olaf's position and she found a sufficiently exciting career in managing clara's house in keeping it above the criticism of the ericsons in pampering olaf to keep him from finding fault with his wife and in concealing from every one clara's domestic infelicities while clara slept of a morning joanna vavrika was bustling about seeing that olaf and the men had their breakfast and that the cleaning or the butter-making or the washing was properly begun by the two girls in the kitchen then at about eight o'clock she would take clara's coffee up to her and chat with her while she drank it telling her what was going on in the house old mrs ericsson frequently said that her daughter-in-law would not know what day of the week it was if joanna did not tell her every morning mrs ericsson despised and pitied joanna but did not wholly dislike her the one thing she hated in her daughter-in-law above everything else was the way in which clara could come it over people it enraged her that the affairs of her son's big barn-like house went on as well as they did and she used to feel that in this world we have to wait over long to see the guilty punished suppose joanna vavrika died or got sick the old lady used to say to olaf your wife wouldn't know where to look for her own dishcloth olaf only shrugged his shoulders the fact remained that joanna did not die and although mrs ericsson often told her she was looking poorly she was never ill she seldom left the house and she slept in a little room off the kitchen no ericsson by night or day could come prying about there to find fault without her knowing it her one weakness was that she was an incurable talker and she sometimes made trouble without meaning to this morning clara was tying a wine-coloured ribbon about her throat when joanna appeared with her coffee after putting the tray on a sewing-table she began to make clara's bed chattering the while in bohemian well olaf got off early and the girls are baking i'm going down presently to make some poppy-seed bread for olaf he asked for prune preserves at breakfast and i told him i was out of them and to bring some prunes and honey and cloves from town clara poured her coffee ugh i don't see how men can eat so much sweet stuff in the morning too her aunt chuckled knowingly bait a bear with honey as we say in the old country was he cross her niece asked indifferently olaf oh no he was in fine spirits he's never cross if you know how to take him i never knew a man to make so little fuss about bills i gave him a list of things to get a yard long and he didn't say a word just folded it up and put it in his pocket i can well believe he didn't say a word clara remarked with a shrug some day he'll forget how to talk oh but they say he's a grand speaker in the legislature he knows when to keep quiet that's why he's got such influence in politics the people have confidence in him joanna beat up a pillow and held it under her fat chin while she slipped on the case her niece laughed maybe we could make people believe we were wise auntie if we held our tongues 
why did you tell mrs ericson that norman threw me again last saturday and turned my foot she's been talking to olaf joanna fell into great confusion oh but my precious the old lady asked for you and she's always so angry if i can't give an excuse anyhow she needn't talk she's always tearing up something with that motor of hers when her aunt clattered down to the kitchen clara went to dust the parlour since there was not much there to dust this did not take very long olaf had built the house new for her before their marriage but her interest in furnishing it had been short-lived it went indeed little beyond a bath-tub and her piano they had disagreed about almost every other article of furniture and clara had said she would rather have her house empty than full of things she didn't want the house was set in a hillside and the west windows of the parlour looked out above the kitchen yard thirty feet below the east windows opened directly into the front yard at one of the latter clara while she was dusting heard a low whistle she did not turn at once but listened intently as she drew her cloth slowly along the round of a chair yes there it was i dreamt that i dwelt in marble halls she turned and saw niels ericsson laughing in the sunlight his hat in his hand just outside the window as she crossed the room he leaned against the wire screen aren't you at all surprised to see me clara vavrika no i was expecting to see you mother ericsson telephoned olaf last night that you were here niels squinted and gave a long whistle telephoned that must have been while eric and i were out walking isn't she enterprising lift this screen won't you clara lifted the screen and niels swung his leg across the window sill as he stepped into the room she said you didn't think you were going to get ahead of your mother did you he threw his hat on the piano oh i do sometimes you see i'm ahead of her now i'm supposed to be in anders wheatfield but as we were leaving mother ran her car into a soft place beside the road and sank up to the hubs while they were going for horses to pull her out i cut away behind the stacks and escaped nils chuckled clara's dull eyes lit up as she looked at him admiringly you've got them guessing already i don't know what your mother said to olaf over the telephone but he came back looking as if he'd seen a ghost and he didn't go to bed until a dreadful hour ten o'clock i should think he sat out on the porch in the dark like a graven image it had been one of his talkative days too they both laughed easily and lightly like people who have laughed a great deal together but they remained standing anders and otto and peter looked as if they had seen ghosts too over in the threshing field what's the matter with them all clara gave him a quick searching look well for one thing they've always been afraid you have the other will nils looked interested the other will yes a later one they knew your father made another but they never knew what he did with it they almost tore the old house to pieces looking for it they always suspected that he carried on a clandestine correspondence with you for the one thing he would do was to get his own mail himself so they thought he might have sent the new will to you for safe keeping the old one leaving everything to your mother was made long before you went away and it's understood among them that it cuts you out that she will leave all the property to the others your father made the second will to prevent that i've been hoping you had it it would be such fun to spring it on them clara laughed mirthfully a thing she did not often do now nils shook his head reprovingly come now you're malicious no i'm not but i'd like something to happen to stir them all up just for once there never was such a family for having nothing ever happen to them but dinner and threshing i'd almost be willing to die just to have a funeral you wouldn't stand it for three weeks nils bent over the piano and began pecking at the keys with the finger of one hand i wouldn't my dear young lady how do you know what i can stand you wouldn't wait to find out clara flushed darkly and frowned i didn't believe you would ever come back she said defiantly eric believed i would and he was only a baby when i went away 
However, all's well that ends well, and I haven't come back to be a skeleton at the feast. We mustn't quarrel. Mother will be here with a search warrant pretty soon. He swung round and faced her, thrusting his hands into his coat pockets. Come, you ought to be glad to see me, if you want something to happen. I'm something, even without a will. We can have a little fun, can't we? I think we can. She echoed him. I think we can. They both laughed, and their eyes sparkled. Clara Vavrika looked ten years younger than when she had put the velvet ribbon about her throat that morning. "'You know, I'm so tickled to see Mother,' Nils went on. "'I didn't know I was so proud of her. A regular pile-driver. How about little pigtails down at the house? Is Olaf doing the square thing by those children?' Clara frowned pensively. Olaf has to do something that looks like the square thing, now that he's a public man. She glanced drolly at Niels. But he makes a good commission out of it. On Sundays they all get together here and figure. He lets Peter and Anders put in big bills for the keep of the two boys, and he pays them out of the estate. They are always having what they call accountings. Olaf gets something out of it, too. I don't know just how they do it, but it's entirely a family matter, as they say, and when the Ericsons say that— Clara lifted her eyebrows. Just then the angry honk-honk of an approaching motor sounded from down the road. Their eyes met, and they began to laugh. They laughed as children do when they cannot contain themselves and cannot explain the cause of their mirth to grown people, but share it perfectly together. When Clara Vavrika sat down at the piano after he was gone, she felt that she had laughed away a dozen years. She practiced as if the house were burning over her head. When Niels greeted his mother and climbed into the front seat of the motor beside her, Mrs. Erickson looked grim but she made no comment upon his truancy until she had turned her car and was retracing her revolutions along the road that ran by Olaf's big pasture. Then she remarked dryly, "'If I were you, I wouldn't see too much of Olaf's wife while you are here. She's the kind of woman who can't see much of men without getting herself talked about. She was a good deal talked about before he married her. "'Hasn't Olaf tamed her?' Nils asked indifferently. Mrs. Erickson shrugged her massive shoulders. Olaf don't seem to have much luck when it comes to wives. The first one was meek enough, but she was always ailing, and this one has her own way. He says if he quarreled with her, she'd go back to her father, and then he'd lose the Bohemian vote. There are a great many bohunks in this district. But when you find a man under his wife's thumb, you can always be sure there's a soft spot in him somewhere. Nils thought of his own father and smiled. She brought him a good deal of money, didn't she, besides the Bohemian vote? Mrs. Erickson sniffed. Well, she has a fair half-section in her own name, but I can't see as that does Olaf much good. She will have a good deal of property some day, if old Vavrika don't marry again, but I don't consider a saloon-keeper's money as good as other people's money. Nils laughed outright. Come, mother, don't let your prejudices carry you that far. Money's money. Old Vavrika's a mighty decent sort of a saloon-keeper. Nothing rowdy about him. Mrs. Erickson spoke up angrily. Oh, I know you always stood up for them. But hanging around there when you were a boy never did you any good, Nils, nor any of the other boys who went there. There weren't so many after her when she married Olaf, let me tell you. She knew enough to grab her chance. Nils settled back in his seat. Of course I like to go there, mother, and you were always cross about it. You never took the trouble to find out that it was the one jolly house in this country for a boy to go to. All the rest of you were working yourselves to death, and the houses were mostly a mess, full of babies and washing and flies. Oh, it was all right, I understand that, but you are young only once, and I happened to be young then. Now, Vavrika's was always jolly. He played the violin, and I used to take my flute, and Clara played the piano, and Joanna used to sing bohemian songs. She always had a big supper for us, herrings and pickles and poppy-seed bread and lots of cake and preserves. 
old joe had been in the army in the old country and he could tell lots of good stories i can see him cutting bread at the head of the table now i don't know what i'd have done when i was a kid if it hadn't been for the vavrikas really and all the time he was taking money that other people had worked hard in the fields for mrs ericson observed so do the circuses mother and they're a good thing people ought to get fun for some of their money even father liked old joe your father mrs ericson said grimly liked everybody as they crossed the sand creek and turned into her own place mrs ericson observed there's olaf's buggy he stopped on his way from town nils shook himself and prepared to greet his brother who was waiting on the porch olaf was a big heavy norwegian slow of speech and movement his head was large and square like a block of wood when nils at a distance tried to remember what his brother looked like he could recall only his heavy head high forehead large nostrils and pale blue eyes set far apart olaf's features were rudimentary the thing one noticed was the face itself wide and flat and pale devoid of any expression betraying his fifty years as little as it betrayed anything else and powerful by reason of its very stolidness when olaf shook hands with nils he looked at him from under his light eyebrows but nils felt that no one could ever say what that pale look might mean the one thing he had always felt in olaf was a heavy stubbornness like the unyielding stickiness of wet loam against the plough he had always found olaf the most difficult of his brothers how do you do nils expect to stay with us long oh i may stay forever nils answered gaily i like this country better than i used to there's been some work put into it since you left olaf remarked exactly i think it's about ready to live in now and i'm about ready to settle down nils saw his brother lower his big head exactly like a bull he thought mother's been persuading me to slow down now and go in for farming he went on lightly olaf made a deep sound in his throat farming ain't learned in a day he brought out still looking at the ground oh i know but i pick things up quickly nils had not meant to antagonize his brother and he did not know now why he was doing it of course he went on i shouldn't expect to make a big success as you fellows have done but then i'm not ambitious i don't want much a little land and some cattle maybe olaf still stared at the ground his head down he wanted to ask nils what he had been doing all these years that he didn't have a business somewhere he couldn't afford to leave why he hadn't more pride than to come back with only a little sole leather trunk to show for himself and to present himself as the only failure in the family he did not ask one of these questions but he made them all felt distinctly humph nils thought no wonder the man never talks when he can butt his ideas into you like that without ever saying a word i suppose he uses that kind of smokeless powder on his wife all the time but i guess she has her innings he chuckled and olaf looked up never mind me olaf i laugh without knowing why like little eric he's another cheerful dog eric said olaf slowly is a spoiled kid he's just let his mother's best cow go dry because he don't milk her right i was hoping you'd take him away somewhere and put him into business if he don't do any good among strangers he never will this was a long speech for olaf and as he finished it he climbed into his buggy nils shrugged his shoulders same old tricks he thought hits from behind you every time what a whale of a man he turned and went round to the kitchen where his mother was scolding little eric for letting the gasoline get low Four. joe vavrika's saloon was not in the county seat where olaf and mrs ericson did their trading but in a cheerfuller place a little bohemian settlement which lay at the other end of the county ten level miles north of olaf's farm clara rode up to see her father almost every day vavrika's house was so to speak in the back yard of his saloon 
the garden between the two buildings was enclosed by a high board fence as tight as a partition and in summer joe kept beer tables and wooden benches among the gooseberry bushes under his little cherry tree at one of these tables niels ericsson was seated in the late afternoon three days after his return home joe had gone in to serve a customer and niels was lounging on his elbows looking rather mournfully into his half-emptied pitcher when he heard a laugh across the little garden clara in her riding habit was standing at the back door of the house under the grapevine trellis that old joe had grown there long ago niels rose come out and keep your father and me company we've been gossiping all afternoon nobody to bother us but the flies she shook her head no i never come out here any more olaf doesn't like it i must live up to my position you know you mean to tell me you never come out and chat with the boys as you used to he has tamed you who keeps up these flower beds i come out on sundays when father is alone and read the bohemian papers to him but i am never here when the bar is open what have you two been doing talking as i told you i've been telling him about my travels i find i can't talk much at home not even to eric clara reached up and poked with her riding whip at a white moth that was fluttering in the sunlight among the vine leaves i suppose you will never tell me about all those things where can i tell them not in olaf's house certainly what's the matter with our talking here he pointed persuasively with his hat to the bushes and the green table where the flies were singing lazily above the empty beer-glasses clara shook her head weakly no it wouldn't do besides i am going now i'm on eric's mare would you be angry if i overtook you clara looked back and laughed you might try and see i can leave you if i don't want you eric's mare can't keep up with norman nils went into the bar and attempted to pay his score big joe six feet four with curly yellow hair and moustache clapped him on the shoulder not a goddamn of your money go in my drawer you hear only next time you bring your flute ta -da 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 -da. joe wagged his fingers in imitation of the flute player's position my clara she will come all the time sundays and play for me she not like to play at ericsson's place he shook his yellow curls and laughed. "'Not a goddamn a fun at Ericsson's. You come a Sunday. You like a fun. No forget the flute.' Joe talked very rapidly, and always tumbled over his English. He seldom spoke it to his customers, and had never learned much. Nils swung himself into the saddle and trotted to the west end of the village, where the houses and gardens scattered into prairie land and the road turned south. Far ahead of him, in the declining light, he saw Clara Vavrika's slender figure loitering on horseback. He touched his mare with the whip and shot along the white level road under the reddening sky. When he overtook Olaf's wife, he saw that she had been crying. "'What's the matter, Clara Vavrika?' he asked kindly. "'Oh, I get blue sometimes. It was awfully jolly living there with father. I wonder why I ever went away.' Nils spoke in a low, kind tone that he sometimes used with women. That's what I've been wondering these many years. You were the last girl in the country I'd have picked for a wife for Olaf. What made you do it, Clara? I suppose I really did it to oblige the neighbors, Clara tossed her head. People were beginning to wonder. To wonder? Yes, why I didn't get married. I suppose I didn't like to keep them in suspense. I've discovered that most girls marry out of consideration for the neighborhood. Nils bent his head toward her, and his white teeth flashed. I'd have gambled that one girl I knew would say, Let the neighborhood be damned. Clara shook her head mournfully. You see, they have it on you, Nils. That is, if you're a woman, they say you're beginning to go off. That's what makes us get married. We can't stand the laugh. Nils looked sidewise at her. He had never seen her head droop before. Resignation was the last thing he would have expected of her. In your case, there wasn't something else? Something else? I mean, you didn't do it to spike somebody? Somebody who didn't come back? Clara drew herself up. 
Oh, I never thought you'd come back. Not after I stopped writing to you, at least. That was all over, long before I married Olaf. It never occurred to you, then, that the meanest thing you could do to me was to marry Olaf. Clara laughed. No, I didn't know you were so fond of Olaf. Nils smoothed his horse's mane with his glove. You know, Clara Vavrika, you are never going to stick it out. You'll cut away some day, and I've been thinking you might as well cut away with me. Clara threw up her chin. Oh, you don't know me as well as you think. I won't cut away. Sometimes, when I'm with father, I feel like it, but I can hold out as long as the Ericsons can. They've never got the best of me yet. And one can live, so long as one isn't beaten. If I go back to father, it's all up with Olaf and politics. He knows that, and he never goes much beyond sulking. I've as much wit as the Ericsons. I'll never leave them, unless I can show them a thing or two. You mean, unless you can come it over them? Yes, unless I go away with a man who is cleverer than they are, and who has more money. Nils whistled. Dear me, you are demanding a good deal. The Ericsons, take the lot of them, are a bunch to beat. But I should think the excitement of tormenting them would have worn off by this time. It has, I'm afraid, Clara admitted mournfully. Then why don't you cut away? There are more amusing games than this in the world. When I came home I thought it might amuse me to bully a few quarter sections out of the Ericsons, but I've almost decided I can get more fun for my money somewhere else. Clara took in her breath sharply. Ah, you've got the other will. That was why you came home. No, it wasn't. I came home to see how you were getting on with Olaf. Clara struck her horse with the whip, and in a bound she was far ahead of him. Nils dropped one word, damn, and whipped after her, but she leaned forward in her saddle and fairly cut the wind. Her long riding skirt rippled in the still air behind her. The sun was just sinking behind the stubble in a vast, clear sky, and the shadows drew across the fields so rapidly that Nils could scarcely keep in sight the dark figure on the road. When he overtook her, he caught her horse by the bridle. Norman reared, and Nils was frightened for her, but Clara kept her seat. "'Let me go, Nils Ericsson,' she cried. "'I hate you more than any of them. You were created to torture me, the whole tribe of you, to make me suffer in every possible way.' She struck her horse again and galloped away from him. Nils set his teeth and looked thoughtful. He rode slowly home along the deserted road watching the stars come out in the clear violet sky. They flashed softly into the limpid heavens, like jewels let fall into clear water. They were a reproach, he felt, to a sordid world. As he turned across the sand creek, he looked up at the North Star and smiled, as if there were an understanding between them. His mother scolded him for being late for supper. Sections 5 and 6 On Sunday afternoon, Joe Vavrika, in his shirt-sleeves and carpet-slippers, was sitting in his garden, smoking a long-tasseled porcelain pipe with a hunting scene painted on the bowl. Clara sat under the cherry-tree, reading aloud to him from the weekly Bohemian papers. She had worn a white muslin dress under her riding habit, and the leaves of the cherry-tree threw a pattern of sharp shadows over her skirt. The black cat was dozing in the sunlight at her feet, and Joe's dachshund was scratching a hole under the scarlet geraniums and dreaming of badgers. Joe was filling his pipe for the third time since dinner, when he heard a knocking on the fence. He broke into a loud guffaw, and unlatched the little door that led into the street. He did not call Nils by name, but caught him by the hand and dragged him in. Clara stiffened, and the color deepened under her dark skin. Nils, too, felt a little awkward. He had not seen her since the night when she rode away from him, and left him alone on the level road between the fields. Joe dragged him to the wooden bench beside the green table. "'You bring the flute,' he cried, tapping the leather case under Nils' arm. "'Ah, das a good. Now we have some little fun like old times. I got something good for you.' 
Joe shook his finger at Nils and winked his blue eyes, a bright, clear eye, full of fire, though the tiny blood vessels on the ball were always a little distended. "'I got something for you from—' He paused and waved his hands. Hungary, You know Hungary? You wait.' He pushed Nils down on the bench and went through the back door of his saloon. Nils looked at Clara, who sat frigidly with her white skirts drawn tight about her. He didn't tell you he had asked me to come, did he? He wanted a party and proceeded to arrange it. Isn't he fun? Don't be cross. Let's give him a good time. Clara smiled and shook out her skirt. Isn't that like father? And he has sat here so meekly all day. Well, I won't pout. I'm glad you came. He doesn't have very many good times now any more. There are so few of his kind left. The second generation are a tame lot. Joe came back with a flask in one hand and three wine glasses caught by the stems between the fingers of the other. These he placed on the table with an air of ceremony, and going behind Nils, held the flask between him and the sun, squinting into it admiringly. You know dis, Toke? A great friend of mine, he bring dis to me, a present out of Hungary. You know how much it cost dis vine? Just so much what it weigh in gold. Nobody but de nobles drink him in Bohemi. Many, many years I save him up dis toque. Joe whipped out his official corkscrew and delicately removed the cork. De old man de what bring him to me, and dis vine he lay on his belly in my cellar and sleep. And now— carefully pouring out the heavy yellow wine, and now he wake up, and maybe he wake us up too. He carried one of the glasses to his daughter and presented it with great gallantry. Clara shook her head, but seeing her father's disappointment, relented. You taste it first. I don't want so much. Joe sampled it with a beatific expression and turned to Nils. You think him slow, dis vine. He very soft, but he go down hot. You see. After a second glass, Niels declared that he couldn't take any more without getting sleepy. "'Now get your fiddle, Vavrika,' he said as he opened his flute-case. But Joe settled back in his wooden rocker and wagged his big carpet-slipper. "'No, no, 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 no. No play fiddle now any more. Too much ache in the finger. Waving them. All the time rheumatiz. You play the flute. Tet, 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 tet. Bohemi song.' I've forgotten all the bohemian songs I used to play with you and Joanna, but here's one that will make Clara pout. You remember how her eyes used to snap when we called her the bohemian girl. Nils lifted his flute and began, When Other Lips and Other Hearts, and Joe hummed the air in a husky baritone, waving his carpet slipper. Oh, das a fine music, he cried, clapping his hands, as Nils finished. Now, Marble halls, marble halls. Clara, you sing him. Clara smiled and leaned back in her chair, beginning softly, I dreamt that I dwelt in marble halls with vassals and serfs at my knee, and Joe hummed like a big bumblebee. There's one more you always played, Clara said quietly. I remember that best. She locked her hands over her knee and began, the heart bowed down, and sang it through without groping for the words. She was singing with a good deal of warmth when she came to the end of the old song, for memory is the only friend that grief can call its own. Joe flashed out his red silk handkerchief and blew his nose, shaking his head. No, 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 too sad, too sad, I not like it that, play quick something gay now. Nils put his lips to the instrument, and Joe lay back in his chair, laughing and singing. Oh, Evelina, sweet Evelina! Clara laughed, too. Long ago, when she and Nils went to high school, the model student of their class was a very homely girl in thick spectacles. Her name was Evelina Olesen. She had a long swinging walk which somehow suggested the measure of that song, and they used mercifully to sing it to her. That ugly Olison girl, she teach it in the school, Joe gasped, and she still walk just like dot, yup a yup a yup a yup, just like a camel she go. Now, Nils, you have some more little drink. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This time you have to drink, and Clara, she have to, so she show she not jealous. So we all drink to your girl. You not tell her name, eh? 
no 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 i no make you tell she pretty huh she make good sweetheart i bet joe winked and lifted his glass how soon you get married nils screwed up his eyes that i don't know when she says joe threw out his chest that's a way boys talk no way for mans man say you come to the church and get a hurry on you that's a way man talks maybe nils hasn't got enough to keep a wife put in clara ironically how about that nils she asked him frankly as if she wanted to know nils looked at her coolly raising one eyebrow oh i can keep her all right the way she wants to be kept with my wife i'll decide that replied nils calmly i'll give her what's good for her clara made a wry face you'll give her the strap i expect like old peter oleson gave his wife when she needs it said nils lazily locking his hands behind his head and squinting up through the leaves of the cherry tree do you remember the time i squeezed the cherries all over your clean dress and aunt joanna boxed my ears for me my gracious weren't you mad you had both hands full of cherries and i squeezed em and made the juice fly all over you i liked to have fun with you you'd get so mad we did have fun didn't we none of the other kids ever had so much fun we knew how to play nils dropped his elbows on the table and looked steadily across at her i've played with lots of girls since but i haven't found one who was such good fun clara laughed the late afternoon sun was shining full in her face and deep in the back of her eyes there shone something fiery like the yellow drops of tokay in the brown glass bottle can you still play or are you only pretending i can play better than i used to and harder don't you ever work then she had not intended to say it it slipped out because she was confused enough to say just the wrong thing i work between times nils steady gaze still beat upon her don't you worry about my working mrs ericson you're getting like all the rest of them he reached his brown warm hand across the table and dropped it on clara's which was cold as an icicle last call for play mrs ericson clara shivered and suddenly her hands and cheeks grew warm her fingers lingered in his for a moment and they looked at each other earnestly joe vavrika had put the mouth of the bottle to his lips and was swallowing the last drops of the tokay standing the sun just about to sink behind his shop glistened on the bright glass on his flushed face and curly yellow hair look clara whispered that's the way i want to grow old six on the day of olaf ericsson's barn raising his wife for once in a way rose early joanna vavrika had been baking cakes and frying and boiling and spicing meats for a week beforehand but it was not until the day before the party was to take place that clara showed any interest in it then she was seized with one of her fitful spasms of energy and took the wagon and little eric and spent the day on plum creek gathering vines and swamp goldenrod to decorate the barn by four o'clock in the afternoon buggies and wagons began to arrive at the big unpainted building in front of olaf's house when nils and his mother came at five there were more than fifty people in the barn and a great drove of children on the ground floor stood six long tables set with the crockery of seven flourishing ericsson families lent for the occasion in the middle of each table was a big yellow pumpkin hollowed out and filled with woodbine in one corner of the barn behind a pile of green and white striped watermelons was a circle of chairs for the old people the younger guests sat on bushel measures or barbed wire spools and the children tumbled about in the haymow the box stalls clara had converted into booths the framework was hidden by goldenrod and sheaves of wheat and the partitions were covered with wild grapevines full of fruit at one of these joanna vavrika watched over her cooked meats enough to provision an army and at the next her kitchen girls had ranged the ice-cream freezers and clara was already cutting pies and cakes against the hour of serving at the third stall little hilda in a bright pink lawn dress dispensed lemonade throughout the afternoon olaf as a public man had thought it inadvisable to serve beer in his barn 
but joe vavrika had come over with two demijohns concealed in his buggy and after his arrival the wagon-shed was much frequented by the men hasn't cousin clara fixed things lovely little hilda whispered when nils went up to her stall and asked for lemonade nils leaned against the booth talking to the excited little girl and watching the people the barn faced the west and the sun pouring in at the big doors filled the whole interior with a golden light through which filtered fine particles of dust from the haymow where the children were romping there was a great chattering from the stall where joanna vavrika exhibited to the admiring women her platters heaped with fried chicken her roasts of beef boiled tongues and baked hams with cloves stuck in the crisp brown fat and garnished with tansy and parsley the older women having assured themselves that there were twenty kinds of cake not counting cookies and three dozen fat pies repaired to the corner behind the pile of watermelons put on their white aprons and fell to their knitting and fancy work they were a fine company of old women and a dutch painter would have loved to find them there together where the sun made bright patches on the floor and sent long quivering shafts of gold through the dusky shade up among the rafters there were fat rosy old women who looked hot in their best black dresses spare alert old women with brown dark veined hands and several of almost heroic frame not less massive than old mrs erickson herself few of them wore glasses and old mrs fenson a danish woman who was quite bald wore the only cap among them mrs oleson who had twelve big grandchildren could still show two braids of yellow hair as thick as her own wrists among all these grandmothers there were more brown heads than white they all had a pleased prosperous air as if they were more than satisfied with themselves and with life nils leaning against hilda's lemonade stand watched them as they sat chattering in four languages their fingers never lagging behind their tongues look at them over there he whispered detaining clara as she passed him aren't they the old guard i've just counted thirty hands i guess they've wrung many a chicken's neck and warmed many a boy's jacket for him in their time in reality he fell into amazement when he thought of the herculean labours those fifteen pairs of hands had performed of the cows they had milked the butter they had made the gardens they had planted the children and grandchildren they had tended the brooms they had worn out the mountains of food they had cooked it made him dizzy clara vavrika smiled a hard enigmatical smile at him and walked rapidly away nils eyes followed her white figure as she went toward the house he watched her walking alone in the sunlight looked at her slender defiant shoulders and her little hard-set head with its coils of blue-black hair no he reflected she'd never be like them not if she lived here a hundred years she'd only grow more bitter you can't tame a wild thing you can only chain it people aren't all alike I mustn't lose my nerve. He gave Hilda's pigtail a parting tweak and set out after Clara. Where to? he asked as he came upon her in the kitchen. I'm going to the cellar for preserves. Let me go with you. I never get a moment alone with you. Why do you keep out of my way? Clara laughed. I don't usually get in anybody's way. Nils followed her down the stairs and to the far corner of the cellar, where a basement window let in a stream of light. From a swinging shelf Clara selected several glass jars, each labelled in Joanna's careful hand. Nils took up a brown flask. What's this? It looks good. It is. It's some French brandy father gave me when I was married. Would you like some? Have you a corkscrew? I'll get glasses. When she brought them, Nils took them from her and put them down on the window sill. Clara Favrika, do you remember how crazy I used to be about you? Clara shrugged her shoulders. Boys are always crazy about somebody or other. I dare say some silly has been crazy about Evelina Oleson. You got over it in a hurry. Because I didn't come back, you mean? I had to get on, you know, and it was hard sledding at first. Then I heard you'd married Olaf. And then you stayed away from a broken heart, Clara laughed. 
and then I began to think about you more than I had since I first went away. I began to wonder if you were really as you had seemed to me when I was a boy. I thought I'd like to see. I've had lots of girls, but no one ever pulled me the same way. The more I thought about you, the more I remembered how it used to be, like hearing a wild tune you can't resist, calling you out at night. It had been a long while since anything had pulled me out of my boots, and I wondered whether anything ever could again. Niels thrust his hands into his coat pockets and squared his shoulders, as his mother sometimes squared hers, as Olaf, in a clumsier manner, squared his. So I thought I'd come back and see. Of course, the family have tried to do me, and I rather thought I'd bring out father's will and make a fuss. But they can have their old land. They've put enough sweat into it. He took the flask and filled the two glasses carefully to the brim. I've found out what I want from the Ericsons. Drink, scold, Clara. He lifted his glass, and Clara took hers with downcast eyes. Look at me, Clara Vavrika. Skol. She raised her burning eyes and answered fiercely, Skol. The barn supper began at six o'clock and lasted for two hilarious hours. Jense Nielsen had made a wager that he could eat two whole fried chickens, and he did. Eli Swanson stowed away two whole custard pies, and Nick Hermanson ate a chocolate layer cake to the last crumb. There was even a cookie contest among the children, and one thin, slab-like bohemian boy consumed sixteen and won the prize, a gingerbread pig, which Joanna Vavrika had carefully decorated with red candies and burnt sugar. Fritz Zweihart, the German carpenter, won in the pickle contest, but he disappeared soon after supper and was not seen for the rest of the evening. Jo Vavrika said that Fritz could have managed the pickles all right, but he had sampled the demijohn in his buggy too often before sitting down to the table. While the supper was being cleared away, the two fiddlers began to tune up for the dance. Clara was to accompany them on her old upright piano, which had been brought down from her father's. By this time Nils had renewed old acquaintances. Since his interview with Clara in the cellar, he had been busy telling all the old women how young they looked, and all the young ones how pretty they were, and assuring the men that they had here the best farmland in the world. He had made himself so agreeable that old Mrs. Erickson's friends began to come up to her and tell how lucky she was to get her smart son back again, and pleased to get him to play his flute. Joe Vavrika, who could still play very well when he forgot that he had rheumatism, caught up a fiddle from Johnny Olison and played a crazy bohemian dance tune that set the wheels going. When he dropped the bow, every one was ready to dance. Olaf, in a frock coat and a solemn made-up necktie, led the grand march with his mother. Clara had kept well out of that by sticking to the piano. She played the march with a pompous solemnity, which greatly amused the prodigal son, who went over and stood behind her. "'Oh, aren't you rubbing it into them, Clara Vavrika? And aren't you lucky to have me here, or all your wit would be thrown away?' "'I'm used to being witty for myself. It saves my life.' The fiddles struck up a polka, and Niels convulsed Joe Vavrika by leading out Evelina Olesen, the homely schoolteacher. His next partner was a very fat Swedish girl, who, although she was an heiress, had not been asked for the first dance, but had stood against the wall in her tight, high-heeled shoes, nervously fingering a lace handkerchief. She was soon out of breath, so Nils led her, pleased and panting, to her seat, and went over to the piano, from which Clara had been watching his gallantry. "'Ask Olina Jensen,' she whispered. "'She waltzes beautifully.' Olina, too, was rather inconveniently plump, handsome in a smooth, heavy way, with a fine color and good-natured, sleepy eyes. She was redolent of violet sachet powder, and had warm, soft, white hands, but she danced divinely, moving as smoothly as the tide coming in. "'There, that's something like,' Nils said, as he released her. "'You'll give me the next waltz, won't you? Now I must go and dance with my little cousin.' Hilda was greatly excited when Nils went up to her stall and held out his arm. Her little eyes sparkled, but she declared that she could not leave her lemonade. 
old mrs ericson who happened along at this moment said she would attend to that and hilda came out as pink as her pink dress the dance was a shodasha and in a moment her yellow braids were fairly standing on end bravo nils cried encouragingly where did you learn to dance so nicely my cousin clara taught me the little girl panted nils found eric sitting with a group of boys who were too awkward or too shy to dance and told him that he must dance the next waltz with hilda the boy screwed up his shoulders ah nils i can't dance my feet are too big i look silly don't be thinking about yourself it doesn't matter how boys look nils had never spoken to him so sharply before and eric made haste to scramble out of his corner and brush the straw from his coat clara nodded approvingly good for you nils i've been trying to get hold of him they dance very nicely together i sometimes play for them i'm obliged to you for teaching them there's no reason why he should grow up to be a lout he'll never be that he's more like you than any of them only he hasn't your courage from her slanting eyes clara shot forth one of those keen glances admiring and at the same time challenging which she seldom bestowed on any one and which seemed to say yes i admire you but i am your equal clara was proving a much better host than olaf who once the supper was over seemed to feel no interest in anything but the lanterns he had brought a locomotive headlight from town to light the revels and he kept skulking about it as if he feared the mere light from it might set his new barn on fire his wife on the contrary was cordial to every one was animated and even gay the deep salmon colour in her cheeks burned vividly and her eyes were full of life she gave the piano over to the fat swedish heiress pulled her father away from the corner where he sat gossiping with his cronies and made him dance a bohemian dance with her in his youth joe had been a famous dancer and his daughter got him so limbered up that every one sat round and applauded them the old ladies were particularly delighted and made them go through the dance again from their corner where they watched and commented the old women kept time with their feet and hands and whenever the fiddle struck up a new air old mrs svenson's white cap would begin to bob clara was waltzing with little eric when nils came up to them brushed his brother aside and swung her out among the dancers remember how we used to waltz on rollers at the old skating rink in town i suppose people don't do that any more we used to keep it up for hours you know we never did moon around as other boys and girls did it was dead serious with us from the beginning when we were most in love with each other we used to fight you were always pinching people your fingers were like little nippers a regular snapping turtle you were lord how you'd like stockholm sit out in the streets in front of cafes and talk all night in summer just like a reception officers and ladies and funny english people jolliest people in the world the swedes once you get them going always drinking things champagne and stout mixed half and half serve it out in big pitchers and serve plenty slow pulse you know they can stand a lot once they light up they're glow-worms i can tell you all the same you don't really like gay people i don't no i could see that when you were looking at the old women there this afternoon they're the kind you really admire after all women like your mother and that's the kind you'll marry is it miss wisdom you'll see who i'll marry and she won't have a domestic virtue to bless herself with she'll be a snapping turtle and she'll be a match for me all the same they're a fine bunch of old dames over there you admire them yourself no i don't i detest them you won't when you look back on them from stockholm or budapest freedom settles all that oh but you're the real bohemian girl clara vavrika nils laughed down at her sullen frown and began mockingly to sing oh how could a poor gypsy maiden like me expect the proud bride of a baron to be clara clutched his shoulder hush nils everyone is looking at you i don't care 
They can't gossip. It's all in the family, as the Ericsons say when they divide up little Hilda's patrimony amongst them. Besides, we'll give them something to talk about when we hit the trail. Lord, it will be a godsend to them. They haven't had anything so interesting to chatter about since the grasshopper year. It'll give them a new lease on life. And Olaf won't lose the Bohemian vote, either. They'll have the laugh on him, so they'll vote two apiece. They'll send him to Congress. They'll never forget his barn party, or us. They'll always remember us as we're dancing together now. We're making a legend. Where's my waltz, boys? he called as they whirled past the fiddlers. The musicians grinned, looked at each other, hesitated, and began a new air and Nils sang with them as the couples fell from a quick waltz to a long, slow glide. When other lips and other hearts their tale of love shall tell, in language whose excess imparts the power they feel so well. The old women applauded vigorously. What a gay one he is, that Nils! And old Mrs. Vincent's cap lurched dreamily from side to side to the flowing measure of the dance of days that have as happy been, and you'll remember me. Sections 7 and 8 The moonlight flooded that great silent land. The reaped fields lay yellow in it. The straw stacks and poplar windbreaks threw sharp black shadows. The roads were white rivers of dust. The sky was a deep crystalline blue, and the stars were few and faint. Everything seemed to have succumbed, to have sunk to sleep, under the great golden tender midsummer moon. The splendor of it seemed to transcend human life and human fate. The senses were too feeble to take it in, and every time one looked up at the sky one felt unequal to it, as if one were sitting deaf under the waves of a great river of melody. Near the road, Nils Ericsson was lying against a straw stack in Olaf's wheat field. His own life seemed strange and unfamiliar to him, as if it were something he had read about, or dreamed and forgotten. He lay very still, watching the white road that ran in front of him, lost himself among the fields, and then, at a distance, reappeared over a little hill. At last, against the this white band he saw something moving rapidly, and he got up and walked to the edge of the field. She is passing the row of poplars now, he thought. He heard the padded beat of hoofs along the dusty road, and as she came into sight he stepped out and waved his arms. Then, for fear of frightening the horse, he drew back and waited. Clara had seen him, and she came up at a walk. Nils took the horse by the bit and stroked his neck. "'What are you doing out so late, Clara Vavrika? "'I went to the house, but Joanna told me you had gone to your father's. "'Who can stay in the house on a night like this? "'Aren't you out yourself?' "'Ah, but that's another matter.' "'Nils turned the horse into the field. "'What are you doing? "'Where are you taking, Norman?' "'Not far, but I want to talk to you to-night. "'I have something to say to you.' I can't talk to you at the house with Olaf sitting there on the porch, weighing a thousand tons. Clara laughed. He won't be sitting there now. He's in bed by this time and asleep, weighing a thousand tons. Nils plodded on across the stubble. Are you really going to spend the rest of your life like this, night after night, summer after summer? Haven't you anything better to do on a night like this than to wear yourself and Norman out, tearing across the country to your father's and back? Besides, your father won't live forever, you know. His little place will be shut up or sold, and then you'll have nobody but the Ericsons. You'll have to fasten down the hatches for the winter then. Clara moved her head restlessly. Oh, don't talk about that. I try never to think of it. If I lost father, I'd lose everything, even my hold over the Ericsons. Bah! You'd lose a good deal more than that. You'd lose your race, everything that makes you yourself. You've lost a good deal of it now. Of what? Of your love of life, your capacity for delight. Clara put her hands up to her face. I haven't, Niels Ericsson, I haven't. Say anything to me but that. I won't have it, she declared vehemently. 
Nils led the horse up to a straw stack and turned to Clara, looking at her intently as he had looked at her that Sunday afternoon at Vavrika's. "'But why do you fight for that so? What good is the power to enjoy if you never enjoy? Your hands are cold again. What are you afraid of all the time? Ah, you're afraid of losing it. That's what's the matter with you. And you will, Clara Vavrika, you will. When I used to know you, Listen, you've caught a wild bird in your hand, haven't you, and felt its heart beat so hard that you were afraid it would shatter its little body to pieces. Well, you used to be just like that, a slender, eager thing with a wild delight inside you. That is how I remembered you, and I come back and find you a bitter woman. This is a perfect ferret fight here. You live by biting and being bitten. Can't you remember what life used to be? can't you remember that old delight i've never forgotten it or known its like on land or sea he drew the horse under the shadow of the straw stack clara felt him take her foot out of the stirrup and she slid softly down into his arms he kissed her slowly he was a deliberate man but his nerves were steel when he wanted anything something flashed out from him like a knife out of a sheath Clara felt everything slipping away from her. She was flooded by the summer night. He thrust his hand into his pocket, and then held it out at arm's length. Look, he said. The shadow of the straw stack fell sharp against his wrist, and in the palm of his hand she saw a silver dollar shining. That's my pile, he muttered. Will you go with me? Clara nodded and dropped her forehead on his shoulder. Nils took a deep breath. "'Will you go with me to-night?' "'Where?' she whispered softly. "'To town, to catch the midnight flyer.' Clara lifted her head and pulled herself together. "'Are you crazy, Nils? We couldn't go away like that.' "'That's the only way we ever will go. You can't sit on the bank and think about it. You have to plunge. That's the way I've always done, and it's the right way for people like you and me. There's nothing so dangerous as sitting still.' You've only got one life, one youth, and you can let it slip through your fingers if you want to. Nothing easier. Most people do that. You'd be better off tramping the roads with me than you are here. Nils held back her head and looked into her eyes. But I'm not that kind of a tramp, Clara. You won't have to take in sewing. I'm with a Norwegian shipping line, came over on business with the New York offices, but now I'm going straight back to Bergen. I expect I've got as much money as the Ericsons. Father sent me a little to get started. They never knew about that. There, I hadn't meant to tell you. I wanted you to come on your own nerve. Clara looked off across the fields. It isn't that, Nils, but something seems to hold me. I'm afraid to pull against it. It comes out of the ground, I think. I know all about that. One has to tear loose. You're not needed here. Your father will understand. He's made like us. As for Olaf, Johanna will take better care of him than ever you could. It's now or never, Clara Vavrika. My bag's at the station. I smuggled it there yesterday. Clara clung to him and hid her face against his shoulder. Not tonight, she whispered. Sit here and talk to me tonight. I don't want to go anywhere tonight. I may never love you like this again. Nils laughed through his teeth. "'You can't come that on me. That's not my way, Clara Vavrika. Eric's mare is over there behind the stacks, and I'm off on the midnight. It's good-bye, or off across the world with me. My carriage won't wait. I've written a letter to Olaf. I'll mail it in town. When he reads it, he won't bother us, not if I know him. He'd rather have the land.' Besides, I could demand an investigation of his administration of Cousin Henrik's estate, and that would be bad for a public man. You've no clothes, I know, but you can sit up to-night, and we can get everything on the way. Where's your old dash, Clara Vavrika? What's become of your bohemian blood? I used to think you had courage enough for anything. Where's your nerve? What are you waiting for? Clara drew back her head, and he saw the slumberous fire in her eyes. "'For you to say one thing, Nils Erikson. "'I never say that thing to any woman, Clara Vavrika.' He leaned back, 
lifted her gently from the ground, and whispered through his teeth, "'But I'll never, never let you go, not to any man on earth but me. Do you understand me? Now, wait here.' Clara sank down on a sheaf of wheat and covered her face with her hands. She did not know what she was going to do, whether she would go or stay. The great silent country seemed to lay a spell upon her. The ground seemed to hold her as if by roots. Her knees were soft under her. She felt as if she could not bear separation from her old sorrows, from her old discontent. They were dear to her. They had kept her alive. They were a part of her. There would be nothing left of her if she were wrenched away from them. Never could she pass beyond that skyline against which her restlessness had beat so many times. She felt as if her soul had built itself a nest there, on that horizon at which she looked every morning and every evening, and it was dear to her, inexpressibly dear. She pressed her fingers against her eyeballs to shut it out. Beside her she heard the tramping of horses in the soft earth. Nils said nothing to her. He put his hands under her arms and lifted her lightly to her saddle. Then he swung himself into his own. We shall have to ride fast to catch the midnight train. A last gallop, Clara Vavrika, forward! There was a start, a thud of hoofs along the moonlit road, two dark shadows going over the hill, and then the great still land stretched untroubled under the azure night. Two shadows had passed. 8. A year after the flight of Olaf Ericsson's wife, the night train was steaming across the plains of Iowa. The conductor was hurrying through one of the day coaches, his lantern on his arm, when a lank, fair-haired boy sat up in one of the plush seats and tweaked him by the coat. "'What is the next stop, please, sir?' "'Red Oak, Iowa. But you go through to Chicago, don't you?' He looked down and noticed that the boy's eyes were red and his face was drawn, as if he were in trouble. "'Yes, but I was wondering whether I could get off at the next place and get a train back to Omaha.' "'Well, I suppose you could. Live in Omaha?' "'No, in the western part of the state. How soon do we get to Red Oak?' Forty minutes. You'd better make up your mind so I can tell the baggageman to put your trunk off.' "'Oh, never mind about that. I mean, I haven't got any,' the boy added, blushing. "'Run away,' the conductor thought, as he slammed the coach door behind him. Eric Erickson crumpled down in his seat and put his brown hand to his forehead. He had been crying, and he had had no supper, and his head was aching violently. "'Oh, what shall I do?' he thought, as he looked dully down at his big shoes. "'Nils will be ashamed of me. I haven't got any spunk.' Ever since Nils had run away with his brother's wife, life at home had been hard for little Eric. His mother and Olaf both suspected him of complicity. Mrs. Erickson was harsh and fault-finding, constantly wounding the boy's pride, and Olaf was always getting her against him. Jo Vavrika heard often from his daughter. Clara had always been fond of her father, and happiness made her kinder. She wrote him long accounts of the voyage to Bergen, and of the trip she and Nils took through Bohemia to the little town where her father had grown up, and where she herself was born. She visited all her kinsmen there, and sent her father news of his brother, who was a priest, of his sister, who had married a horse-breeder, of their big farm and their many children. These letters Joe always managed to read to little Eric. They contained messages for Eric and Hilda. Clara sent presents, too, which Eric never dared to take home, and which poor little Hilda never even saw, though she loved to hear Eric tell about them when they were out getting the eggs together. But Olaf once saw Eric coming out of Vavrika's house. The old man had never asked the boy to come into his saloon, and Olaf went straight to his mother and told her. That night Mrs. Erickson came to Eric's room after he was in bed and made a terrible scene. She could be very terrifying when she was really angry. She forbade him ever to speak to Vavrika again, and after that night she would not allow him to go to town alone. So it was a long while before Eric got any more news of his brother. 
But old Joe suspected what was going on, and he carried Clara's letters about in his pocket. One Sunday he drove out to see a German friend of his, and chanced to catch sight of Eric sitting by the cattle pond in the big pasture. They went together into Fritz Oberly's barn, and read the letters and talked things over. Eric admitted that things were getting hard for him at home. That very night old Joe sat down and laboriously penned a statement of the case to his daughter. Things got no better for Eric. His mother and Olaf felt that, however closely he was watched, he still, as they said, heard. Mrs. Erickson could not admit neutrality. She had sent Joanna Vavrika packing back to her brothers, though Olaf would much rather have kept her than Anders eldest daughter, whom Mrs. Erickson installed in her place. He was not so high-handed as his mother, and he once sulkily told her that she might better have taught her granddaughter to cook before she sent Joanna away. Olaf could have borne a good deal for the sake of prunes, spiced in honey, the secret of which Joanna had taken away with her. At last two letters came to Joe Vavrika, one from Nils, enclosing a postal order for money to pay Eric's passage to Bergen, and one from Clara, saying that Nils had a place for Eric in the office of his company, that he was to live with them, and that they were only waiting for him to come. He was to leave New York on one of the boats of Nils' own line. The captain was one of their friends, and Eric was to make himself known at once." Nils' directions were so explicit that a baby could have followed them, Eric felt, and here he was, nearing Red Oak, Iowa, and rocking backward and forward in despair. Never had he loved his brother so much, and never had the big world called to him so hard, but there was a lump in his throat which would not go down. Ever since nightfall he had been tormented by the thought of his mother, alone in that big house that had sent forth so many men. Her unkindness now seemed so little, and her loneliness so great. He remembered everything she had ever done for him, how frightened she had been when he tore his hand in the corn-sheller, and how she wouldn't let Olaf scold him. When Nils went away, he didn't leave his mother all alone, or he would never have gone. Eric felt sure of that. The train whistled. The conductor came in, smiling, not unkindly. "'Well, young man, what are you going to do? We stop at Red Oak in three minutes.' "'Yes, thank you. I'll let you know.' The conductor went out, and the boy doubled up with misery. He couldn't let his one chance go like this. He felt for his breast pocket and crackled Nils' kind letter to give him courage. He didn't want Nils to be ashamed of him. The train stopped. Suddenly he remembered his brother's kind, twinkling eyes that always looked at you as if from far away. The lump in his throat softened. Ah, but Nils, Nils would understand, he thought. That's just it about Nils. He always understands. A lank, pale boy with a canvas telescope stumbled off the train to the Red Oak siding, just as the conductor called, All aboard! The next night Mrs. Erickson was sitting alone in her wooden rocking-chair on the front porch. Little Hilda had been sent to bed, and had cried herself to sleep. The old woman's knitting was in her lap, but her hands lay motionless on top of it. For more than an hour she had not moved a muscle. She simply sat, as only the Ericksons and the mountains can sit. The house was dark, and there was no sound but the croaking of the frogs down in the pond of the little pasture. Eric did not come home by the road, but across the fields, where no one could see him. He set his telescope down softly in the kitchen shed, and slipped noiselessly along the path to the front porch. He sat down on the step without saying anything. Mrs. Erickson made no sign, and the frogs croaked on. At last the boy spoke timidly. "'I've come back, mother.' "'Very well,' said Mrs. Erickson. Eric leaned over and picked up a little stick out of the grass. "'How about the milking?' he faltered. "'That's been done hours ago.' "'Who did you get?' "'Get? I did it myself. I can milk as good as any of you.' Eric slid along the step nearer to her. "'Oh, mother, why did you?' he asked sorrowfully. "'Why didn't you get one of Otto's boys?' 
"'I didn't want anybody to know I was in need of a boy,' said Mrs. Erickson bitterly. She looked straight in front of her, and her mouth tightened. "'I always meant to give you the home farm,' she added. The boy started and slid closer. "'Oh, mother!' he faltered. "'I don't care about the farm. I came back because I thought you might be needing me, maybe.' He hung his head and got no further. "'Very well,' said Mrs. Erickson. Her hand went out from her suddenly and rested on his head. Her fingers twined themselves in his soft, pale hair. His tears splashed down on the boards. Happiness filled his heart. McClure's August 1912 End of Part 13